Okay, so today is uh, the conversion lab for the 30th of September. And I want to cover a topic that has applications for uh, your own business, whether your own projects and or client projects, right? And so I wanted to cover both. This is a common request we get. We don't do too many uh, custom projects because I just don't have the time for it. Uh, but I've done quite a few in the past. And so uh, late last, in the last month or so, I've uh, I've done I've done been working on a Web three project. It's a very large, uh, uh, well, it's a very well funded, I should say, um, startup based out of Dubai in Web three technology. So it was interesting to me to work on a project like that. So that's why I took that project on, uh, mainly just to learn about Web three, which is uh, which has been very very interesting. So this is not about Web three. Let's uh, talk about the actual delivery part of it. So I'll talk about pricing and sort of, uh, you know, sort of selling of this uh, next week. But I wanted to cover off the delivery of it because uh, even though, you know, a lot of people on Facebook groups and all this stuff like saying, I'm having a hard time getting clients, the, the, the real problem is actually not the client acquisition side. Though for that person, that problem is real. It's it's that a lot of people can't scale this beyond doing a handful of projects and then they sort of, you know, they sort of max out. And so how, how do you do this at, at scale was, has always been the, uh, the question we, um, I, I did it some time ago, but I didn't, I, I didn't have the right team with me. So, so we're, uh, we're rebuilding this part up, uh, principally because it's, it's getting easier to deliver these sort of services. Uh, that's firstly, also my, my own personal understanding of how do you deliver these services has has um, has also increased uh, you know by a lot as well so that's the other reason for for bringing these sort of things back in so in the next uh, uh, two three months we'll have something uh, available uh, so anyone wants to it's once again it's not going to be a big part of the business I prefer not to do it but if someone's getting really stuck here let's just take care of it for you that's the uh, that's the main reason. Um, the other reason is is that whenever I, I palmed it out saying, hey, listen, just go and see this X person, it always comes back saying Nick, it was crap or sort of I was only happy with the way they did tracking or something, but everything else was just a you know, bit of a shit show and I couldn't get anything done or it was delayed and so on and so forth. So I wanted to cover that off uh, as well as part of the experience. So the first thing is obviously you want to look at the, the client or the person who's requesting this. And what are their expectations, and and what are their skill uh, skills levels? And I'll cover something at the bottom here as well. Uh, what's your current growth and profitability? You know, is it new niche is existing? You know, have they bought a service similar to yours, as in a done for you service previously? And what's their what's their position on kind of like kind of a project creep? And the reason for 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 doing um, this, I learned quite late actually, after I had one or two very difficult projects is when I realized, you know what, I, I need to go back and kind of reassess how we're doing this um, and 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 uh, kind of like the auditing the client became kind of like the number one thing to do for, for me, at least in, in the framework that we follow, that's the first thing we do. I couldn't care about the project or the job or how much it's gonna get, it's gonna get paid. Am I, am I dealing with the right group of people here for whom uh, this is a good fit, as in whatever we're gonna do? And they're of the, of the type of person that, that actually should buy this and can afford it. So the should part is actually an important one because sometimes I'll I'll jump on calls and, and someone will be like, hey, Nick, I want you to you know do a project for me. And I'm like, okay, cool. So what do you currently do? It's like, oh, I've just started uh, uh, a new business. And I'll be like, okay, so you've done this uh, previously and this is a, what, a new niche you're going into? Or tell me what, what do you mean by new? And it'll be like, no, I haven't done in this this online thing before. And that to me is a disaster. So I normally avoid those clients. Now that's not to say that someone out there has not built a framework on how to work with them, but but oftentimes they 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 end up becoming uh, not necessarily problem clients. It's 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 a problem. Not, not, not that the client is a problem. The, the project is a problem because because they, there's so many unknown unknowns on the client side, as in they're not quite sure what you're going to deliver. They've never done this before. In their, their, in their mind, there's no, there's no success criteria. Like, like what, 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 does a success, what does a successful campaign or a project look like? And, and they don't have that in their head because they've never done anything like this before. 
So generally speaking, I tend to avoid those people. I, and, I, and I advise anyone who's going to be doing done for you stuff, generally to avoid that or strip it right down and say, okay, fine, I'm going to do a, an audit for you. I'm going to sell you an audit for, you know, what's that, 500 bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever, $10,000, whatever level of client you're working with. And then have that be the way to move to phase two and phase three. But one is, we'll talk about all that selling type stuff next week. And that's the most important one that I've found. If uh, and I'm I'm more than in in my case, how I do projects now is is I'm actually walking away unless I'm given a good enough reason to stay, rather than the other way around. Like uh, yeah, I'd I'd rather not because it obviously sucks the life out of you. It is it is time for money type work, and and uh, and it, at this stage of of lead Zook's growth, I, I I'm only doing it to to get an existing user over the line, uh, or you work with an existing user to to make sure that they can kind of scale up. But generally speaking, anyone who's never worked with me before, I or, or, or uses Leadsuit for that matter, I, I generally avoid those projects. That's, that's not to say there's not a lot of money out there for it. So, anyone who's doing this uh, for uh, for other clients uh, or for internal uh, projects, that is a great way to start. Let's say you've got a new person who's joined the team or a new uh, or a new division you're opening up. Same applies. You treat that internal person as your external client. And you'll go through the same questions as to who the hell are you working with and all that sort of stuff. Now, the most important one was the position project pre. So in my in the project I was working on, the web pre one, it was basically uh, build the entire funnel, um, but and to get them to book a call so they can jump onto a, a webinar and then they can you know show them you know what the opportunities and all that sort of stuff. And and I said, oh, show me the webinar. So I, sh I looked at the webinar and I said, all right, I'm I'm not going to do the webinar because that's not part of the project. But here are the 15, 20 things they can change. So they went and they had a thought about it and they can just came back to me saying, hey, Nick, can you just do the webinar as well for us? So that's what I mean by project creep. Uh, they're very well funded. So you know, the, the, the money thing wasn't an issue. But, but, the, but, the, but the task grew to include a, a almost like an 80 or 100 slide uh, you know, uh, webinar, like hour to hour and a half. Right? So I, I wrote that whole thing uh, from, from scratch. But that wasn't part of the initial project because they were pretty happy with the webinar they were running. And I, and I said, listen, well, here's what I'll do. As part of sweetening the deal of doing the, the funnel for you, let me review uh, the webinar. And if I see any gaps in it, I'll just tell you what, what they are. And you guys can go and fix them at your at your own time. So that was one way in which I was able to add a lot of value to the to the project itself without, uh, so I, I sweetened the deal, right? Basically uh, by saying, listen, for the same price, I'll, I'll throw in a webinar review. Um, and that ended up becoming a, a job in itself, actually. So, so project creep can happen. But sometimes project creep happens because of or because of really bad uh, uh, project plan. I'll, I'll get to that very shortly. Right. So that's kind of like the the client side. You want to make sure you're working with the right person, um, and uh, and they have the ability to. They already growing, profitable, and so on and so forth. Uh, new niche, you want to be a bit more careful than existing niche. Existing niches, obviously, they know a lot about it, which means they'll be able to tell you whether you've you're going down the right path because you can bounce ideas of them. Um, if it's a new niche and they've never done it before, then that becomes a little bit risky because all the all the research and work falls on your shoulders. And generally speaking, you're, you're going to find that the client does not have that much. Uh, it's quite thin. So in my case, in the project I worked on, despite the fact that they're experts at Web3, the their understanding of, of who we should go target was actually not quite very well defined. Which is understandable. It's a new project, right? So, so that's uh, and that's the reason why I took it on board is because I'm using some some uh, uh, some AI stuff to help me do that, and I wanted to validate that the that the concept actually works, and it came out to be quite quite good. So then comes project audit. So is it clear on what they want? Generally speaking, uh, if they say like make me a funnel, that's usually like a big warning sign, um, because uh, because what does that mean? Right, and so you want to get clear on them as to as to what the hell are you looking for. I sometimes will draw a map, which is media buying on this side, acquiring clients on that side, and then have all the steps in the middle and say, okay, well, let's let's go through this entire process map, uh, and what are what are you doing? What am I doing? Right, and that's we want to make it very very clear as to where the 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 clear demarcation is, so that there's no overlap. Like, are you doing tracking? Or am I doing tracking? Right? And they're like, oh no, I've got a tracking person in house. Okay, great. I and I would note that down, and that becomes as part of the project plan. Um, we use a, a, an app called um, called Teamwork, and I'll assign that to them actually in the project um, plan itself. Right? Do they have the skills to uh, to to deliver? Uh, right? Uh, sorry. Do you have the skills to to deliver what they're requiring? 
Because sometimes they'll be like, hey, can you also do A, B, C, D, E, F, G? And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good with A, B, C. I don't know about the other two or three, but they look easy. And that normally is a big warning sign. You, you want to resist that. What you can do is say, listen, why don't I deliver on, on this A, B, C first? And then let's do the other part later. Let's get something off the ground. So oftentimes you're better off stripping the project down to something that's deliverable, uh, that, that has, has got some chance of getting into the market and is very well defined as to what you're going to do and what they're going to do. If, it, if, if the project starts growing and you start doing, you know, bolting all sorts of stuff on, it's usually a warning sign and you want to kind of walk away uh, from that. Oh, not walk away. You, you have to go back to the negotiating table and saying, listen, either it's going to, it's going to stretch in two ways, right? Either it's going to cost you more and I need more time, right? And you need to negotiate those, both of those things, obviously. All right. So once again, we'll talk about pricing and all that stuff uh, next week. The skills and cap capability segregation. Yeah, what will you do and what is required from the client? You know, do you need research from them? Do you need access to internal resources? Do you need their sales data? Do you need their current lead data? Do you need access to the call center? Like what, what what's going to help you deliver, deliver the project? And you want to get very clear as to what those things are, because if they can't give them to you, then you're going to have to get that elsewhere, right? Like the idea that I'm going to make do without it really is a warning sign, at least in my book. Because what happens is you're, you're shrinking the amount of... Uh, amount of uh, research you're going to be doing or the amount of work you need to get done to deliver a successful project. If you start just cutting corners everywhere, then it's going to, it's going to deliver an outcome that, that probably is not going to work. So, so it's important to, 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 this is not to say uh, that, that this is not required, but more, where am I going to get it from? So if you've got a client that's been working in the industry for, let's say, you know, 10 years, then they, they have a lot of this stuff internally and you can just say to them, Hey, listen, I'm looking for this 25, you know, pieces of information, who do you have this available, you know, you know, and normally they'll have like a Google drive or something where all the stuff is just dumped in there and it, and they give you access to it. Yeah. It does require a fair bit of searching and all that kind of stuff to get it done, but that, it, that works as well. Right. So as long as you've got some access to that information to get the job done, and that's the really important part. And, and obviously access the, the logins and, you know, inviting you to Google tag manager and Facebook and so on and so forth. Sometimes, it takes so long to get that information out. Um, in fact, I'm still waiting on the guy I'm working with to access to their to their booking. Uh, you know, they schedule once, I think is what they're using. I'm still waiting for the embed code. So like, we're kind of like stuck. The whole funnel's done, but I can't embed the that whole thing. And, and yeah, you know, I get it. Clients have priorities. You know, they're probably going through a whole bunch of extra uh, stuff that they're working on. So you just gotta kind of, yeah. So I, I take the approach of, hey, listen, end of the day, uh, I've been paid, so I want to push you. But once again, you need to own the the project, right? I'm not I'm not your dad, and this is not my project. This is your project that I'm helping you complete. So I kind of nudge, uh, you know, slightly, just make sure you're moving in the right direction. Uh, and usually that gets the that gets the job done. Sometimes you'll see people they just they just disappear. Actually, um, I've had that happen a few times where they'll pay you and they'll disappear. Um, yeah, and you chase and chase and chase, and then you just kind of, yeah, just write off the project, I guess, or whatever. The next step is, all right, next comes the project plan, right? So separate out what you'll do and what the client will do. Make it very, very clear. If you have to jump on the call, uh, run through the project plan with them, even if you, if you even if you don't give them access to it or if they don't want access to it, make sure that you're very, very clear. Uh, what's going to happen in what order? Um, and mark the places where, where you can... Um, where, where they can, there can be, I should say, there can be time creep, sort of stuff. So the, the most time creepy part is, is the research part because you think you're going to get everything done and then when you go into it, you realize you just didn't get the, the data you needed or to, to really build a case that you want to do for the sales, uh, for the for the promo. So in my own case, um, you know, I, I thought like, you know, one whole weekend, you know, you know a good 10 hours a day for two, three days is going to be enough for the research. But uh, it, it took a lot, lot, lot longer. I had to go to Twitter and do searches. I went to, you know, I went to Reddit and I went to Quora and, and a whole bunch of places, plus the research papers and all sorts of stuff. So it took me uh, really a lot longer to get hold of the information that I wanted to build the case. What I was trying to show is that Web3 is growing um, and compare it to where the internet was, um, you know, six, seven years into the boom. And to show that if Web3 is above where the internet was, then can you imagine what's going to happen in five years or 10 years from now? So almost like show the show the hockey stick. I wanted to present that as a as one of the as one of the elements as to why this is such a good opportunity, right? So I was looking for that data point to make that point. Um, because 
because these guys are putting a lot of money behind it. I believe it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an extremely well-funded project. So the, the potential to scale big for them is actually, is actually going to be quite big. So I want to make sure that I do everything in my power to give them every, every element that they can use to make the sales argument in their webinar. Uh, and, and the funnel for that matter to really, you know, grow. Right. So, so, so yes, yeah, so I, I wouldn't, and, and I told them, I said, listen, because I can see how much money you're putting into this, you're obviously wouldn't be putting this kind of money in unless you were thinking, uh, you know, the, of the other side of it, which is how big it's going to get. So because you're putting in so much money into it and resources into it, then I, then just give me a little bit of slack on the time. Because if I can't find the data point, I'm gonna to have to go deep and try and find stuff, right? So, so give me extend that little bit of uh, leeway to me, which they did, which was nice. No, not every project is gonna be like that, uh, but in their case, you know that that was the case. They they also got it that you know this is all very very new. There's not a lot of data available. They surely didn't have access to a lot of this stuff. Well, they had a good under a technical understanding, but it's not like they were keeping a marketing file for me to come around. So, so therefore, a lot of lot of time was spent in searching. For, for for the data points for to to build the case, right? And then and then client did you, and lastly your team. Now what's going to happen is oftentimes when you build a project, you're going to have essentially a a tracking thing. You're going to have a design thing. Uh, you're going to have some split testing or scripting type of a role. You're going to have obviously the copy stuff. You're going to have you know if, if there's a webinar required, then you might hire a specialist webinar person. You obviously need the ads and the banners and all that stuff. So you could probably have a separate person for that. Making sure that that when you plan the project out, that all of those people are available to do the job. There's nothing worse than you think you're going to be done in seven days, but then the design guy is offline because of or holidays or they're working on some other project or whatever the heck it is. And all of a sudden you've got like this four or five day gap there now and they can't fulfill. So you got to make sure that 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 in the in the in the in the plan you create that all the the the, the, the human resources are uh, uh, have all confirmed that they'll be available uh, to do the job that's required as you moving through the different pieces right and so on, on, and i found sometimes that that can really you know get you into a bit of a pickle because you're like oh crap i thought the 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 the, the webinar designer person was going to be available but they're not or or, or, or whatever it be right and so so just be just be very of that and that that is all you sort of need for on the delivery side of things, and obviously the the, the delivering of it, uh, uh, it would be to execute your 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 project plan. Um, but being but I think you can avoid a lot of problems in done for your services, but by, by just not signing up clients that are not a good fit. And I know that a lot of webinars and a lot of Facebook groups focus a lot on how to sign the customer. Um, the the problem is that if you sign the wrong person or if you don't have the skill set to deliver what the client really needs. Then you are going to have, you know, you know, a bad experience. Uh, for if, uh, partly your fault, as in our fault as as service providers, if we take on projects that we just don't have the skill set to deliver on, and sometimes people do it for money, right? So you just want to be careful of that. Uh, the other time is it's uh, your fault as well when you take on a client that's just not a good fit for for you, or who hasn't done that. So usually, have you bought a service like this uh, or a, a similar to yours previously? If they say no, that's a big red flag uh, for me. Because they've never gone through an experience where potentially they're paying, you know, you know, I don't know, five grand, ten grand, twenty grand, fifty grand, depending on what kind of project you're working on, and what kind of sales materials you've created. It could be a fairly high ticket or relatively high ticket item, and with that comes responsibility. Like no one's going to give you, you know, twenty grand, thirty grand, and you not deliver, right? So, so, so just making sure that that the pricing aligns to to what the outcome you're going to deliver on. We'll talk a bit more about that next week, but that sort of covers. Uh, this little section on uh, on on done for you service and sort of uh, what it takes to to uh, to actually uh, to actually deliver uh, and, and stuff always takes a lot lot longer than what you think it does. So, any questions on this before we move on to any general questions? Yeah, Nick, how how do you set that out for the client? Obviously, it depends on their position, and you know you're established as an authority, but. How would, yeah. how would you map this out for, for them? Uh, okay, so generally, uh, so you mean to say the project plan part of it or, or, or the or the, the, the whole? The, yeah, I get, well, everything that's here in front of us. The, okay. Um, yeah, the okay, filter. yeah. So, right, so so what I actually do is I actually have a, uh, have a lucid chart where I've got all the steps sort of lined up. And I basically, when I jump on the call, 
because um, obviously we've, we've had a little bit of a chat, so th th there's been some pre-qualification that's happened um, as to as to what the project is about. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's something I, I, I'm interested in doing. So jump on the call, we can, and then I just go through basically. All right, so who on your team will be working on this project? Uh, what are their skill sets? What, what what does the team look like? Who are they? So you know, it's John, Jenny, Kenny. Great. What are their skill set? Um, and what and where are they working on the project, or are they just people that are available to to tap? Uh, you know, sort of tap those resources as and when needed. Who else is going to be my point? Who's going to give me access to the logins? Yada, yada, yada. Let's, let's start going through the, the the sort of nitty gritty stuff of things. And then I'll, yeah. So then, so what I do is I, I normally have a have a map. The, the first one is, is where you work on the business flow. So on, on your on your left hand side, so your left, you have media buying. And on the on the other side, you have essentially the final delivery of the service. And you have the the internal steps between there. So you got media buying. You've got uh, ads, uh, banners, all that stuff. You've got uh, you've got uh, you know the, the landing pages. You've got the decision trees, all that stuff. You've got the thank you pages. You've got videos, webinars. Uh, you know any of that sort of uh, whatever happens post. Uh, if there's if there's call centers, then you obviously include that. And then uh, the email and SMS follow ups, all that sort of stuff. So we broke the whole steps up. Now you say well. What am I working on? What are you working on? Or what do you have in place already that I can leverage off? And so they'll be like, oh, you know what? We've, we've, we've got the media buying uh, team internally that's done. Or I might say, listen, that's the one thing I don't do. I don't do your media buying. So do you have a media buyer? Yes or no? If you have a media buyer, great. We can talk about the rest. If you don't have a media buyer, I'm sorry, there's no sale. I mean, there's no point in me carrying on here with you because that's the one piece that I will not do for you. So you gotta go get it. That's in, that's in my case. Obviously, you know, if if, the, if your service is providing media buying as part of it, then that obviously would be one one thing you, that you do provide. And then I, I talk through each of the elements, just make sure that we're all above board. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll uh, I'll I'll create below that notes about what I'm going to deliver on each step. What does this funnel actually going to look like? And then I do a little video. And in the video, I explain what the pieces are. We're actually clear as to what your role is. We're actually clear as to what my role is. We're actually clear as to what is going to be delivered, the final outcome. And uh, and then through that, I actually then deliver them the, the price and so on and so forth. So that's, yeah, it's, it's basically just a diagram that I talk through. Um, and then I summarize it uh, with a follow-up video where I explain all of that. And the reason for doing that is twofold. Number one is I was very clear as to what the hell we're going to be doing here. What what am I going to be doing or what I will not touch, right? So that's been very clear. The 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 And the video is essentially documented evidence as to what I said I would do to you that you agreed to. So there's no, I said, he said, you said, we said stuff going on after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and that can happen when you're working on projects, projects like this. So, so I, I found that a, a lot more diligence up front in the project plan is is probably going to be the best way uh, forward. I I found so I've done projects where I've made them, I've kind of forced them to come into teamwork. That usually doesn't work so well unless there's someone who's quite comfortable working in project management systems. So that's one thing I probably should have added in here is to ask them sort of you know what's their what sort of interface do they want with you. Like, well, what's a communication channel they want with you? Some of them will say, listen, just private message me and email me. Great. You, you work out if that's acceptable to you, if that's the case. Uh, sometimes what I've done is if I think it's a really big project and, and I want to make sure that their email is not stuck in every other email that I've got, then I actually go and we'll just go and create a brand new email. And I'll give that email just to them. That way, that email I can share with my team as well or so on and so forth. So anything that comes through there, gets managed and looked after and after the project's done you can you can you can kill the kill the email uh um, you know keep uh, the get rid of the email address i've done that in the in the past because sometimes what you find you you know you're gonna work with people and they 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 refuse to come out to any platform they're like no i'm just gonna email you and and you know what that, 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 that's fine it's, it's not a big deal as long as you manage how the emails go back and forth and so I'm very clear when when a new topic comes on so here's how I do my email management on a, on a project like this if if so let's say in an email they said, yeah, you know, you know, ABC, and then they mentioned something you haven't spoken about before, and that's going to be a topic of a new discussion or a new, new outcome or whatever. I literally copy and paste that into a new email, change the subject line, and reply just with that portion. So if someone emails me with five things, I'll turn those into five different replies when I'm because that way it allows me to keep 
a, a track record of what's actually happened. And I and and I, and I and I and I've taught my team to do that as well. Generally speaking, when you're working in an internal project management system, those things will show up as 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 project line items, and so it's much easier to or or, or swim lines or whatever they would be, and so they're easier to manage. But uh, otherwise, you wanna because otherwise you you'll get lost. Is like what was that thing that I spoke about tracking, and and now you're going through tons and tons of email. Um, you know, threads to try and find the information. So I found that is a fairly effective way to manage, uh, to manage um, uh, sort of, you know, multiple lines. Because email is not the best thing to manage projects with. In fact, it's probably one of the worst things that that, <laughs> that you can manage projects with. But unfortunately, the the reality of the situation is that there, the, you you will run into people who that is their primary medium of communication, and to get them onto Teamwork or Asana or any one of the other kind of project management systems is next to impossible. And uh, and as a result, you know, no, nothing's going to move. So so yeah, so so you you got to compromise uh, every so often. I, I used to be quite quite hard and fast. I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm only I'm only, I'm I'm only going to do it if you come join the project management system. And I did that with uh, two or three projects, and I found like they, they were actually a horrible experience from both sides because he's like, I can't find the login, and you know, and <laughs> you're getting grumpy about about access to the project management system. So I kind of like, yeah, I I, I reversed that course because I, I learned from that experience. I'm like, okay, you know what? <laughs> There's a group of people out there who you cannot change. And so so it's best to uh, best to work with where they're comfortable and then you manage the best, uh, the, the best way possible. Mm, cool, thank you. No, no problem. It's it's actually a very lucrative area, but very few very few people do it well. Um, because you even agencies, you know, they'll they'll come on, they'll do one or two projects, and then they'll uh, they'll they'll cap out. Because what's what's missing is is that systemization of of the whole thing, like turning into like a, almost like a McDonald's, uh, where you know who's going to make the burger and who's going to fire the chips and all that, that. That if you if you think of it from that perspective, uh, it, the, the, these projects are actually actually use really quite generally not that difficult. Uh, without not not withstanding obviously you know that that first part there which is making sure you don't take on clients that uh, that don't uh, uh, that aren't a good fit for you. Uh, in fact, there was one person that I worked with where they were not interested in server side tracking because they just don't get it, and they were quite adamant that I want you to fire the pixel on a on a, another secondary thank you page, uh, and my team member went through and did it, gave them a better outcome, right? Um, and yeah, he actually got really, really mad. He said, this is not what I asked for. I said to you very clearly that I want my conversion to fire on a new page. And uh, and I said, yeah, that, that you did. So, you know, we apologize and yep, we'll, we'll deliver that now. So this is where where these sort of things you learn about the person and you're like, like they're pretty adamant in how they really want to see things. And that's fine. And you can suggest that, you know, a better approach would be this. Do you still want to do it the old way or the new way? And they say the old way, you know what? That's the end of the day. They're the client and they may have other reasons for it. Perhaps they've got other team members that they're working with, or maybe their team is not very sophisticated. And so, because, because they are, there would be, there could be other considerations that you're not aware of. And so if you're just, if you're just looking just from a marketing standpoint or just from, you know, a conversion standpoint, yeah, you, you're, you're, it, it may very, very well be right that the solution that you offer is the better one, but it just doesn't work in the context in which they operate because they may have team members who just don't get that stuff. So he's like, listen, how am I going to manage this after you finish the project? And so those considerations are not, may not be visible to you. And so, so I normally take the approach of saying, listen, no, like, like I'll present my option, but it's not, you know, it's like, not, not like binding on you in, in any way. And it's not mandatory for you to take it. it. This is what I suggest. And if you, if you, if you trust me or, or if you want us to do the best outcome, do it this way. But if there are some very good reasons why why we shouldn't do it this way, you know what? I respect that, and we'll do it your way. Uh, because uh, yeah, like I said, there could be there could be things that they're considering that you're not aware of. Cool. Any other questions? Jonathan, Eric, how do you guys manage this stuff? That's a great great question. I mean, uh, <laughs> it it is a challenge. We, you know, we've been focused on, on trying to build out, uh, you know, we're, our strengths are definitely on the sales side, bringing in the clients. Yeah. It comes down to delivery. Yeah. Um, and most yeah. of the client, most of the clients that we're talking to are looking for us to drive conversions for them. They're not looking for the A to A to Z type of 
project. Exactly. Yeah. But but it's interesting. It, it, it could be. But right now we're we would it's so it's kind of been that way too for for quite a while if you want my honest opinion with yeah. clients and trying to do the 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 complete agency side yeah i think yeah. initially no, no, i i i absolutely get that that sometimes you only want to do a small piece because that's where your expertise is which is what i said here is like you know you can, do you have the capability to deliver and and you want to you know you want to remove stuff that you don't have a don't have the skill set in or don't have a, don't have the cook the core competency to deliver on. So no, I know I I totally get that. The issue I found, and this is not 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 for you to take on, but something to be aware of as part of the the analysis of the riskiness of the project is that they'll say, "Now only do this," but they don't have the other skills either. And so 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 you're you so you're left in in a to do a project in a vacuum, where where it's almost likely going to fail because they haven't got the other pieces in place. Well, it's very interesting you say that because we're dealing with uh, that scenario right now. We've got right. a client yeah. that wants calls. Yeah. So we're like, okay, let's get these calls set up. <laughs> yep. We get their DID, et cetera, their phone number. And then we realize soon thereafter that they're really not set up to send us their disposition report until like, you know, weeks later, like, oh, wow. It's like, guys, exactly. we need yeah. this like, you know, every week at least. Correct. And, and that's what I mean by like, so in your case, when you build out that, that, that flow that you would talk with the client with, you would say, listen, in order to have a, a successful paper call funnel, these are the 25 pieces that are needed. I'm only going to be delivering on this, you know, five or six things, but can you confirm for me, you have those other things, because if those other things aren't in place, then, then even me delivering you this is not going to get too much, especially when I need that feedback loop coming back from your call center, back to me with the dispositions and all that sort of stuff. And all of a sudden, you know, we, we, we can't deliver the outcome you're looking for because we're not getting the feedback that, that we need to, to course correct. A hundred percent. We're, uh, we're on pause with this client. I mean, it looked like the campaign was doing great. We're like, oh, this has got some, a lot of potential. Then they came back first time, no returns. Then the second time, it was like a month later, and they came back with a 30% return rate. We're like, wait a minute, we're, we're way negative here, guys. So that's kind of what we're going back. And right, forth. yeah, and, and exactly. And, and, and your argument would be, why am I finding out after 30 days? Totally. Yeah, like, like why didn't I find out within three days or, or, or a week at, at, at the latest? Why, why are we finding this out 30 days later? And then now, obviously, they're pissed off because you know they've got a month of, month of calls, and you, you haven't had a chance to... To make adjustments to the funnel, which could have easily, uh, you know, you know, uh, saved a, a whole lot of stress and money and time on on all sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think with some of the the bigger clients, I think honestly, probably better to deal with. Correct. Simply, they're, they're, they've they've got their processes in place. Correct. What we found with the smaller, especially home services, they are just uh, it, it, there's a lot of hand holding. Correct. And it sounds like it's it's good initially, but then at the end of the day, it's like okay, yeah, it's a it's a it's more of a challenge. Yeah, I I, I agree, I agree, and 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 that's where you want to be very clear as to who you want to work with, right? So let's mm -hmm. so in your case, you obviously don't want to work with the, the the smaller level clients who don't have the systems and processes in place. So in your case, your your client audit would include stuff like that. It's like okay, cool. Do you have, you know, you know, whatever your, 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 your paper call infrastructure in place? Do you have, you know, this in place, that in place and, and whatever the various questions that need to be asked, you would actually assess, even though that may not directly be related to what you're going to be doing, but the fact that they don't have those things in place ends up being that they somewhere something's broken. So as a, so you may not actually, you, you may actually have, be in this situation like you currently are, which is 30 or 60 days later, everything is grinds to a halt because they can't, you know, because they actually don't know what's going on. And, you know, it's interesting about what you've got here with the client audit. You know, honestly, it's sometimes it's just one of those things like, hey, let's just bring the client on and let's just see if we can deliver, you know, whether it be leads or calls for them. But it's definitely key here, you know, yeah. setting expectations, understanding, hey, we need returns. We're going to do a max return rate of X, right? Yeah. This is what we're going to agree to ahead of time because it's so much easier to do it ahead of time versus once it's already gone live. Absolutely, and 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 we need the API call to do this or whatever yep. it is. Great. Do you have that in place? No. Okay. Well, then you you need to get that in place first 
because once you start driving traffic, all of a sudden, and you're not going to give me, uh, you know, you're not going to give me your, the the conversion API, uh, you know, or whatever the the, the postback URL info back to me as to what which what what's converting, what's not. I can't really help you. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. No. Awesome. I'm glad uh, you were able to add a bit of texture to the whole question. Of course. Big time. I have a question, Nick. Yeah. Are you, are you using like AI to uh, process like uh, your customer report, like on the quality of the leads and performance? Do you have yes. something that you use that you found that's really helpful? Yeah. So, so um, uh, the, the, the main criteria that I've seen uh, or I've found is basically to making sure that the, that the client gets back to you with what's actually converting on their side. So there was a real horror story that happened a couple of weeks ago. There's a guy that I was working with, uh, this is about a few months ago now. Um, he, um, uh, he ended up, I don't know, you know, making some adjustments to his Facebook ad, uh, you know, because uh, some guru told him on some Facebook group that you should do this to get better ads. He dropped his CPA, but, but, the, but the ad language changed the conversation uh, that he was presented to the marketplace. And so he started getting really uh, lower socioeconomic type leads, like I, i.e. the people who couldn't buy the stuff the client was selling. So he's like, yeah, I've doubled my margin on my side because I used to, you know, get leads for 30 bucks. Now I'm getting them for 15 bucks, but I'm still sending them for 60. So you know what? My margin's gone up. And he was pretty happy for about five or six weeks. And I said to him, I said, be very careful because leads conversion is not the same as sales conversions. Is it backing up for the client? And he came back and he said, uh, you know, it's no, the, 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 basically the first he heard from the client was, here's the notice for 30 days, we're done. As in, it's the end of the relationship. This is someone he'd been working on for five years or four years or whatever it was. Oh, so, yeah, exactly. And th that was it. That's the first time he heard back. And, uh, and I was like, so what actually happened? He said, yeah, the leads I was sending to them uh, were just not backing out in terms of the type of product the client was selling. It was in terms of life insurance policy or whatever. So the type of life insurance policy that that these people were looking for was not the type of life insurance policy that they were selling. So uh, so it it so the ad what the ad did or the, what the language of the ad did and the appeal of the ad did it it started it started getting clientele that were there were there were you know designed to buy lower priced products essentially you know like you know and so. That was it. It was. It was. It was. It's. It, it was the end of the end of the relationship for over four years. Has gone down the. Because what happened when this started happening? They started going out to market and finding another 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 lead gen. They assigned another two or three lead gens to replace him, and then they just gave him a letter saying, "Here, thirty days, we're done." So, uh, yeah. so he was. Yeah. How do I salvage the situation? So, in that kind of a, you know, that. So you got to be really careful that 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 the very first thing you want to do is make sure that the client's giving you feedback. In fact, there was someone I worked on a project a couple of months ago. I said to him, I said, why don't you say this? It's like, whatever, 50 bucks if you give me the data or it's $75 if you don't give me the data. Because if, if you give me the data, I can get you cheaper leads. If you don't give me the data, I'm going to charge you more. So you pick what you want. You want, you want to pay more, you want to pay less. And so you price in such a way that they have to pick you the... And all, all you're looking for there is a CSV file with a, a lead ID or, or an, an SID or, or some way for you to go and work out out of the leads you're sending, where what's converting for them. Now, once you get that, it's a very simple exercise to do. Put just in Excel or Google or whatever, or this is you can shove into AI as well. You can put your leads, uh, uh, you know, CSV file in Claude. You can put your 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 your, your revenue, your sales uh, file, uh, you know, as well, a CSV file, Excel file, and then just tell uh, you know the uh, the AI saying, hey, listen, can you work out for me? Do you see any clusters of uh, of answers? that are resulting in conversions and 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 very quickly you'll you'll discover that there is a there's oftentimes not always that there's a clustering of answers from the decision tree that is giving you a very high uh, much higher than 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 chance uh conversion so you might find that 80 percent of conversions have picked these four or five answers in this way what it's telling you is that is that that is what your ideal customer looks like. Now, what you do is you take that information and you redo the ads and you repeat the cycle again. What you also do is off the traffic that did not convert, which is 80% that didn't result in the in the, in the the sale or, or where you had a much lower percentage of sales, you want to go back and redo a, a funnel for, for them and just change the conversation. Because oftentimes it's not that they're bad leads or you want to verify if, if, if what kind of product or service that they qualify for. So in the case of the life insurance example that I gave you, if the leads were of a lower quality and they were still buying, 
then what you need to look for is not that all oh, these leads are crap. Go and find a client whose business is designed to serve this lower level. Like, like, like because these these leads, I would you would say like they they they're like your Walmart leads, right? They're not your um, uh, the, 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 the they're not your Starbucks or your uh, the the Whole Foods, um, you know, uh, the Whole Foods uh, uh, type of uh, type of a lead. So Walmart Walmart has built a multi billion dollar business on 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 people who who are value buyers. And uh, and Whole Foods has built an entire multi billion dollar business on people who are non value buyers. So if you if you're if you're finding that certain ads are giving you uh, leads that are that are that are value buyers and that's not a good fit for your existing clientele, that doesn't mean that there's no somebody out there who's designed his business or her business or there's a business out there that's designed around the volume play. So they're looking for these cheap lower end because they've got either automated systems or they've got, you know, you know, you know, uh, call centers in Mexico or something or wherever to, to be able to monetize those people. And oftentimes it's a big mistake to say, oh, these leads are crap and I'm just going to kick them out. No, don't kick them out. Spend a bit more time understanding what the hell's going on here. And then what you can do is you can then perhaps find uh, another client and saying, hey, listen, I'm getting, I'm getting leads who are only interested in life insurance products that are less than, you know, $200,000 or whatever. The, the, this is not the million dollar uh, lead. Do you guys look after that market? You know, do, do you guys, is there anybody out there that is selling those kind of nickel and dime type life insurance policies? And their answer is absolutely yes. So now you you now you found a traffic source and all you got to do is go find a client to, to, which is a far easier problem to solve than the other way around. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah, but uh, so, so as the AI, I mean, what did you, you just like load up reports to uh, right. chat GPG and ask him uh, no, for like, no, hey, no, what no, do you... into, 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 into Claude. Um, yeah. Because, Claude. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Claude, you use Claude for yeah, that? Yeah. yeah, yes, yeah, I'll, I'll put it in here. It's, uh, it's here. Uh, yeah, I got Claude. Is it better than chat GPG, you think? Yes, yes, I think so. It, it is better. Have you tried the one from uh, Meta? Meta? Yeah, no. So, so uh, I found that the the uh, I know there was an update over the weekend, so maybe they've gone better now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, as of last week, the the context window was too small. You you couldn't process big lots of stuff. So for Claude, we've got we've got a team account, and that gives us a five hundred k context window, uh, which is a a lot of tokens. So it 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 can process a fair amount of a fair amount of uh, of information. So um, I, I believe that's about one hundred fifty bucks a month. Instead of the the typical twenty thirty dollar plan, Sorry. but but they give you okay. five, yeah, but they give you five users. Uh, I know that I know that Google's just done an update over the weekend, so maybe the, the, that's another place to to try out, which I believe is called Google LLM, uh, and that's another one that's that's uh, that's turned out to be quite okay. Uh, but these are getting really better. If, if they're not doing to, working today, they'll they'll start working in a month or two because they they're just increasing the ability for you to for you to um, put a lot of data into it. And then uh, just ask you not, to yeah yeah find your cluster. I'm sorry, but no, yeah, I was gonna say should that like Facebook LLM like do much better than the other one because they're processing all these ads and campaigns and stuff like that. No, I don't think so because I don't think they have access to that. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I'm not too sure. But clustering, like if, if you're really looking for clustering, then then probably the best one to use is actually uh, called um, it's 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 not very user friendly though. But I, I but I will state it here. Um, Wolfram Alpha. So Wolfram Alpha is probably the best one. It's a it's it's a scientific uh, and and and, ma and mathematical based. Uh, it came from Mathematica was a big product they came up with, and so their LLMs are designed to deal with scientific analysis, like cluster analysis and segmentation analysis. That's the toolkit you're looking for, not necessarily what campaigns they're running. So so that's Wolfram Alpha is probably the. I, I don't think it's needed. It's an overkill. But Claude has an integration into Wolfram Alpha. I haven't played with it, but okay. I ran into it uh, last week, and so I'm so I'm I'm thinking in my head like you know do we do we do we include some of this stuff inside Leadzook? So we we are including some of this stuff inside Leadzook. So you'll be so you won't have to worry about you know dealing with Claude because there's there, the, 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 there's parts of this LLM stuff that is that you you need a database for which are which all this LLM stuff at the moment does not have. So uh, so yeah. But that that would be the other place to look for, which is what it's designed for. So what you're looking for is essentially tell the saying, hey, listen, you know what? I'm looking to see whether you can see any distinct patterns around what types of people are converting and what types of people are not converting. And can you find uh, any columns or answers that have been given 
uh, that would would that you can see any clustering around it, and and you leave it to the AI cool. to come to do the analysis. Yeah, what, and what and what he's going to do is going to say, oh yeah, I found that people who convert usually have you know these types of answers, and that'll be like, oh wow, there's there's actually a segment in there. Um, now the best thing you can do with that is actually change the language of the ad itself, or that would be the test, where you are aligning the ad directly to the answers that have already been given to 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 have a tighter match. Um, to the audience that's there, and, um, and yeah, that's the way to that. That's how I would be using AI. But you need the sales data so you don't go astray with the leads data, which is the, which is why I give that horrible example. Uh, well, not horrible example, the example of the horror story where where, where uh, the the lead gen lost a client because they optimize for leads while the client is optimizing for sales. Right? There's obviously a direct conflict there between the two. Um, you know, the, the leads job is volume of leads while wh while the client is looking for, you know, uh, you know, the, the highest revenue per lead or, or something, some other metric along those lines, not necessarily uh, the, the, the the number of, you know, yeah, the number of leads they buy. So that, that conflict has to be met. And so you, you say, so every lead gen out there needs to be a little bit weary that it's not just worrying about your margin. It's making sure that the leads, when they go to the client, they're backing up for the client as well. Got it. Cool. Yeah. Awesome, man. That was a good, good question. Anything else? Not for me. Cool. All right. All right, guys, there's no more questions. We'll uh, call it a day. We'll do it. Hey, and yeah, real quick. Yeah, yeah, sorry. yeah go for it. Yeah, Eric, go for it. Are you, are you seeing anybody um, finding scale right now in, in with quality in any particular, uh, like, yeah, no, so I have not seen any of the big ones drop off. Um, property may be somewhat uh, affected, uh, I guess, with the, your inability to qualify for loans. Um, so so most of the discretionary markets have been affected to some degree. Um, by discretionary, you know, obviously, like, you know, your, your big ad, ad spend type thing um, have, have been affected somewhat, but the offers have to be, ha has would need to be changed there, maybe offering more payment terms. That, but that, once again, that's not your problem. That's a client's problem. But at the end of the day, the, the clients the clients are having to adjust or should be adjusting how they're closing these people rather than like more payment terms and those, those sort of things rather than, you know, cash up front um, because people are having a hard time qualify for, uh, for, for debt, depending on the market, obviously. So yeah, there has been, there has been some slowdown across the board, uh, but in the aggregate, uh, we we're seeing higher and higher volumes. When you look at our same same uh, same user, um, same client uh, numbers, so we so we track. Uh, if you've been on the platform for a while, then we look at to see what, what is the volume of someone who's been in the platform for a while, and so that way we get a better mm -hmm. idea of where the volume is coming from. Rather than so let's say if we, if we sign up you know hundred new people, then we don't want to add that volume into that and, and and to understand what's actually happening with the existing customer base, our user yeah. base. And, and and we're seeing in a lot of cases that the volumes are uh, have increased. Now, my my suspicion is that one of the reasons why the volumes may have increased is because it's eliminating some of the competitors. Um, so as a result, um, the person who's who's left in the market is picking up more market share. So by that, I'm talking about about scale. So while 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 the pie may be shrinking a little bit, it's also killing off. Uh, people who are not sophisticated, because obviously uh, they will be the first ones to go because their their CPAs won't 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 work. So it it, it weeds out uh, weeds out the weakest, right? In a, in a shrinking in a shrinking market. So so therefore then uh, that that demand then shifts, or at least a portion of the demand shifts elsewhere. And I think that's where a lot of the a lot of the existing people are picking it up. But that's that's the pattern I'm seeing actually. Cool. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, good okay. question. Thank you. Yeah, no, it is it is affecting people. This uh, whole uh, this um, um, uh, you know, obviously interest rates and all that stuff. Um, well, here in well, Australia, much more, principally because oh well, we don't have thirty year fixed mortgages. So when interest rates go up, it 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 changes. You know, within within thirty to sixty days, it it hits you. So uh, so so we don't quite have that leeway that you guys in the U.S. where where you have thirty year loans. So if I'm sitting on a two percent or three percent. Home loan, I, I don't have to be worried about anything until I'm buying a new home. 
or sellers sure. are trying to sell, then obviously it's going to be it's going to affect the market because the buyer is going to be you know buying at six percent or seven percent or whatever the current rate is. Um, while here it affects the existing homeowner pretty much within thirty days because wow. because, because almost ninety percent of the loans in in Australia uh, home loans are actually variable. Wow. Yeah. So 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 we've had people. So I I've got friends of mine who are telling me their mortgage payments have gone up two and a half times. Wow. Yeah. It's 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 like blood on the streets type of stuff at the moment here in this country. I wow, that's very interesting because if, you know here, you know obviously debt's going through the roof. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I was just curious if, if like you know if you're seeing yeah. like debt and then personal loans, you know the quick, you know the uh, the the you know sh short term personal loan type stuff is. I'm hearing it's pretty big too. I was just curious. Yeah, yeah. No, so 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 what could be happening is it's not that people aren't demanding the service, but they may not be qualifying for it because because, because they've maxed out their credit cards and they've maxed out their, their the debt capacity. So obviously, um, so that's not to say that they they there isn't demand for people who are looking for for debt because obviously they they want to you know they looking to you know whatever to live, but the issue is is that is that they just yeah they they won't be qualifying even even at the subprime level. Because they've already maxed out quite a lot of stuff, so so yeah. Um, unfortunately, with the, with the rules that came about after the GFC and all this sort of stuff, uh, lenders have to be a bit more careful uh, because they might be wearing it this time. So so there's a bit more conservativeness. I've got a good friend of mine in uh, in uh, New York State, New York, New Jersey. He has a bunch of restaurants and uh, like like liquor stores and florists and all that. So I called him about uh, about two two weeks ago, three weeks ago. We had, we had a good chat, and I said I said, how are things going? Because he's a he, he has a great ecosystem of of businesses across the board. Because he's got flowers, he's got restaurants, he's got liquor, he's got daycare, he's got you know dry cleaning, he's got like a spa or something, and uh, and so when someone has like you know those many businesses and uh, you know they can see, and I asked him, I said, so how's it going? And he said, across the board we're down. He goes, I've never seen that in twenty years. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. here. In Thanks. A lot of people are down too. Yeah. So, so, so when you have someone where dry cleaning is down or where, you know, things like, you know, you know, liquor sales are down or, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a very, you know, a reasonably priced restaurant is, is down. It's not fine dining or anything or, or, or the florist is down and, and uh, you know, and all that and daycare is down, then, then, you, you know, it, it's hurting. He's got, he's got, he's got another side, another business, which is construction. He said, oh, that's basically dead. Wow. Um, yeah, because because the ability for that person to go out there and get loans doesn't exist. So unless you got yourself a cash buyer or someone who's very wealthy, um, that yeah, it's no, nothing's really getting through. It's it's not that people don't want to get their kitchens done or whatever, but they they they, they, they just can't get the, they just can't get approved for, for for debt. That's it. Yeah. Well, this is the uh, the price you pay for free money, right? That's it. That's exactly it. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> no free lunch in life. Someone's got to pay for it. <laughs> so true. So yeah, true. yeah. I remember, you know, when when I mean, your country printed like hell. So did mine. Um, yeah, I remember having conversation at the time. I said, "Oh man, this is gonna bite in about three, four years, when when the uh, when all that when the uh, when the adrenaline rush is removed from the system, it's gonna it's gonna hurt." Um, so yeah, unfortunately. That this, we we are we are at the cross at that at that at that junction now. So I, I think yeah. so. But in your case, the rates have started moving down, which is which is somewhat good uh, here in Australia. Uh, our Reserve Bank is telling us that our rates are going to be around at this current level for the next uh, at least six to eight months. So I think I think if it if it if it prolongs to that level, then uh, then yeah, people will will we'll have we'll have, we'll have the foreclosure thing that you guys had back in. Your GFC days. Wait. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is no way that that people can hold on to their homes for that long. Um, when you have well, do such... you, also, you have like adjusted rates as well, like uh, every five years or seven years, like it just renew. Uh, no, it's 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 variable, so it adjusts in real time. So it's variable. Yeah, yeah, so if interest rate goes up today, you get hit pretty much within thirty days. Got it. Yeah, uh, same as here. Princeton is more conservative. They do like a uh, long term wait, like. 15 yeah. years 20 years yeah yeah no not here there's no the, there's no long-term rates it's it's uh if anyone does fix it it's like a three-year fix so it gives you like a honeymoon for three years and then it goes variable 
Um, but wow. but what's happening is so what's happening with those people is that when they come off into the variable and now they go back to try and you know refi or something, they they don't qualify with a new lender because it's like it's no tough. your yeah your 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 interest payments have gone or your your repayments have gone up so much that we we, we can't really do anything about this. And uh, and so and the value is done as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. One of those things, man. One of those things. Well, thanks, well, Nick. Appreciate it. All right, guys. Hey, we, yeah, chat soon. See you guys next week.